Okay, people, my next guest, you may know if you follow basketball over the last 20 years or so, or sports in general, and he was featured fairly prominently in that Last Dance documentary about Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls. It's David Aldrin. He's currently the editor-in-chief for the Athletics DC site. He's worked for Turner Sports, ESPN, and the NBA, Washington Post as well. And he's my next guest. We talk a lot about the Last Dance, uh, what it's like for him to be the editor-in-chief for a uh, site, as we are going through the pandemic, kind of being a mentor and coming up with different stories. And we also talk about what documentary he might like to see done next. For the Props Network, this is Just For Sport in three, two, one. All right, thanks David for giving me some time. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I know we could start with The Last Dance, uh, but I really want to start with you being back home, kind of like a homecoming as you are the mm -hmm. editor in chief for The Athletic, the DC region. What has that been like for you to kind of just be back home? And I know that in, in dealing with this in this pandemic, and, uh, and you had a great story uh, that you just posted today talking about the bag full of credentials, which was amazing to just kind of go through the history. Uh, well, you know, it's certainly DC and all the cities, it, it's a challenge right now. It's a major challenge. I mean, there's no playbook for this. We have never experienced anything like this in terms of sports stopping in mass, right? I mean, you know, even after 9-11, as, as horrific as 9-11 was, most sports resumed after a few days. I mm -hmm. mean, baseball came back, the NFL came back, I think two weeks later. Um, so there's nothing that, that we can go back to and refer back to uh, in terms of how do you deal with a global pandemic, you know, where people are vulnerable and and this is ex an extremely passable disease so um we're we're trying to be creative we we have a lot of very smart people throughout the company both at the local and national levels that have spent a lot of time trying to come up with different story ideas and packages um that we've rolled out over the last few weeks to our subscribers you know and we've done a lot of a lot of list stories you know the 25 greatest players that I in history or the, the 10 best teams and all that sort of thing. But we've also done a lot of local stuff. Like we've, we've spent a lot of time in each market talking to players and coaches who play in that market about the places they miss eating at, you know what I mean? Their favorite restaurants yeah. in, in the area or their, you know, the favorite, their favorite places to hang out with their families and things like that. Uh, we're, we're obviously trying to stay on top of the breaking news about how these leagues are trying to all come back online and, and play again um, in the next few weeks, hopefully. Um, but, you know, we have to also be cognizant of the fact that these are people and people with families and families all are unique in the challenges that they have. And so what may work for one family may not work for another family. And so we're trying to tell all of those stories um, and provide that kind of different content to our subscribers so that um, they know that we're not just sitting on our hands or throwing up our hands and saying, well, there's no sports. We can't do anything. You know, we're still trying to provide good content. As you're deciding what you're going to write, looking at the long game of if we don't have sports, but also mm -hmm. in the immediate term, how much do you enjoy if there is a challenge of saying, wow, I've got to come up with a sports story that isn't around a game and I know you can obviously talk to an athlete, but I feel like maybe mm -hmm. there were some things in your mind that you're like, I, if I had time, I'd do it. Mm -hmm. And now maybe you have more time to kind of explore maybe some of your inner thoughts or just some deeper stories that you just kind of had on a back burner, but now you can do them. Well, true. Um, you, have, you have the opportunity now because you're not kind of running around following the bouncing ball, literally, right? So mm -hmm. um, you do have that opportunity. Um, but it's... Um, we also have to we also have to be mindful that what may be interesting to me may not be interesting to our subscribers you know you have to always kind of keep them on the front burner like is this a, if i do this story is this something that people are going to want to read you know that's kind of like the number one thing so i don't want to do a vanity project that i'm interested in if it doesn't interest my my readers or our yeah. readers um so you have to kind of weigh those things and and try to keep come up with things you know that um, again, are, are interesting, um, but are interesting to a lot of people that you hope a lot of people 
will take and, and, and read about. And so, um, you know, that's why it's part of the reason why I've written a lot about the last dance the last five weeks is because I know, you know a lot of people are watching that, you know, and so I think it would be kind of silly not to tap into that if you if you do have some uh, knowledge and history and understanding of what that time was like. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we can transition to the the last dance that you brought up, we can go back. I have a couple other questions about sure. the athletic and Turner, but when did you first, when were you first approached to be a part of the last dance and what kind of honor was it to know that, hey, they, they want to talk to me about Michael Jordan. And I don't know mm -hmm. if you thought you would have as much of a prominent role, but between mm -hmm. you and Michael Wilbot, yeah. I feel like many of the sound bites came from the two of you that kind of span the entire documentary uh well i didn't think i would be you know featured as prominently as they decided to um they came we started i mean it was last year i don't know exactly when they you know one of the producers i don't know if it was jason or or one of the other producers uh came and asked me you know emailed me and said they were doing this and, and you know you kind of heard through the grapevine that this was going to finally happen because it was a. Uh, you know, it had been a, a, a dormant project from NBA Entertainment for, for years. I mean, we all knew about the million feet of film. That's what we always remembered was that they shot a million feet of film in 1998 and they got this incredible access to the Bulls. And we all knew about it, um, but they couldn't find a vehicle for it over those two decades, right? I mean, various ideas that various people had over the years to present that footage never came to fruition and so finally when you know the we we heard that that jordan had kind of given his blessing to it and and you had to have jordan and it didn't make sense you couldn't do it without him right i mean um i think the league had signed off on it um but you needed jordan right so he finally finally agreed so anyway they they came to me last year and said well, you know we're shooting this and we're talking to the, these following people they didn't list all of them but Obviously, if if you're if you know the backstory of that, you want to be a part of it because it's it is the story of the Bulls and Jordan um, that nobody else can tell because nobody else has the has the film. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to definitely be a part of it. We couldn't make it work, you know, time wise. Uh, it it might have involved even the Nats World Series run because I was on covering that as well for the Athletic. Um, so I finally, we finally got a date that worked for both of us and they came to DC. It was sometime in the fall, I wanna say October or November of last year of, of yeah. 2019. Um, and they said, you're, you know, you're one of our last interviews and we wanna make sure, we wanna really make sure that you're in this. So I thought, and again, I'm not trying to be humble here or anything. I figured they must, they must have most of the stuff that they need. <laughs> And maybe I'm just the guy to cover video that they, you know, cover things that they don't have video for. Cause you know, that's TV, you know, I mean, you got to cover everything. And so if they didn't have video of a particular game or a particular shot, they need me to talk about that. Okay. I don't mind doing it. Yeah. And I'll be in the documentary a couple of times here. And there. <laughs> that's fine. I was fine with that. I'd be fine with that. Um, I did not think I was going to be in it as much as I was. I, mm -hmm. I was, it was a, it was a pleasant surprise and I haven't talked to them. I don't know why they made those decisions. I'm just, I'm happy they made them. I hope that they viewed my contributions as, as something worth, you know, putting on as much as they did. Well, we all, as, as I'm a little, you're a big, we all had our David Aldridge moment watching you in the documentary. You're like, that's David. It was just really <laughs> exciting. But, you know, I think what you mentioning, you didn't know how much you would be a part of the documentary. And I knew, well, I mean, I, I, I've always respected you and feel like I know you have a lot of stories, but when you brought up LeBrad for Smith, I was like, I don't think they knew that. I no, feel like didn't. you kicked off an actual yeah. segment. Like you no, they, they didn't, they didn't know it. I mean, you know, whoever, I, I, I mean, whoever was interviewing me, and again, I'm, I'm blanking on exactly who it was that interviewed me, but that person did not know the story. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, do you know the LeBrad for Smith story? And he said, no, I don't know that. What is that? And so I told them. And then I don't know if other people who were also working on the documentary knew it. Maybe they did or maybe they didn't. I don't know. But I know the person that I talked to did not know it and wanted to get chapter and verse on it. And I went into chapter and verse on it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I just think it's so indicative of the kind of guy Jordan is, yeah. you know, and the kind of competitor he is. 
and at least in my world, but I think it was on Twitter too, the debate was, and I'd be curious your thought on it, was mm -hmm. are you, if you're LeBron for Smith, are you like, yeah, I got one on Jordan, even though he torched you back in DC, but you torched mm -hmm. him in Chicago. Right. Or are you more humble? Cause you're like, well, it was only one game. I mean, my career was nowhere near Jordan, but I, I mm -hmm. imagine you getting a, a really good game. Like your name was mentioned in the documentary. That's a right. big deal. I mean, I haven't talked to LeBradford since he left Washington, so I, I can't, I can't speak to what he may be thinking. But I would say, look, if that that's your career night, it's the most, you know, it's his career high in points. He never scored more than twenty points in a game ever again after that night um, in the NBA. So I, I, I'm sure he takes some pride in that, and he should. He had a great night that night. He was fifteen yeah. to twenty from the floor. He was terrific, you know. And there's you know, most 99.9% .9 of people on earth never have a night like that, you know, and, and professional basketball. So, yeah, you know, he should be proud of that, <laughs> you know, and, and the fact that Jordan came back at him as hard as he did to me is a sign of respect, you know, because <laughs> he wanted to get him back for yeah. that night. Now, the, you know, the, the motivation he used was complete nonsense, but, um, but he nonetheless <laughs> was motivated enough to come back strong at him and give him the full Michael the next night. You know, it was the full Michael. It was, <laughs> it was all of it. He gave he empty <laughs> both barrels that night. <laughs> um, the end of the documentary, everyone talked about, oh, he, wouldn't, he wasn't given the opportunity to go for seven. Mm -hmm. And I look back on, yeah, Jerry Krause maybe made a mistake, but at the same time, after three, if I'm talking to Michael, you quit. Mm. You were the ultimate competitor. How did you not say, I'm going to fight through this so that I can win four in a row and five? Mm. And then maybe who knows? They would have won eight in a row, nine in a row. And really, not that he wasn't mm. at a level with six, but I just wonder why he doesn't see, and maybe you have a perspective, why he doesn't see that you did the same thing that Krause did after your third championship. Uh, that's an interesting point um, that I, you know, that I have not heard before. I mean, it's an interesting perspective. I, you know, I think at, at the end of the day, no matter what happened before, if you have a chance to keep Michael Jordan on the basketball court for another year or two, you do everything possible to make that happen. Now, mm -hmm. I am not there every day, right? So I, I know you know, from talking to people, you know, not just on their team, but on other teams. I mean, think about the, the Shaq Kobe Lakers. Mm -hmm. They won three straight. They could have won five straight. They were that good and that dominant. Nobody had an answer for either of them. Right. Yeah. And they just <laughs> couldn't do it anyway. It couldn't be around each other another day. It's just enough with this. You know, I just don't like you. You don't like me. We got to go our separate ways. Um, so that happens, especially when we're talking about the the enormous egos that you have in professional sports, you know, they're so big that a guy like Jerry Krause could have an enormous ego. Right. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, that it's just hard to keep people happy, you know, and so winning, even winning as high at the level that they won at, it got to be so toxic that, that Jerry Krause, you know, again, Jerry Reinsdorf kind of skates on this because he owned yeah. the team. He was the yeah. owner. <laughs> that they said, you know what, enough, we don't want to do this anymore, you know, so, um, and I, I think that, I, I believe that Phil Jackson was done too, now mm -hmm. he, I think he, you know, he had always said, even before this last season, um, that he thought coaches had a shelf life, you only had a certain number of years with the team, no matter how good the coach was, and no matter how good the team was, that after a while the players tune the coach out just because they've heard all the stories, right? I mean, they've heard, they've heard all the all the motivational tactics, um, and so that it, it felt at the time to me like it had run its course. Mm. Now I obviously could be wrong on that. They could have found better, you know. They could have found similar role players to. Kerr and to Luke Longley and those other free agents that were looking for a payday. They could have done that, I think. Um, but I mean, Pippen physically was breaking down. He was starting to break down. 
Jordan was still playing, but was reduced. And I think, again, I think, well, now I get, I, it's hard to say because they, they made it so clear that literally Phil could go 82 and 0 and he wasn't coming back. Yeah. Um, so maybe he feels differently about it if he doesn't know that there's an end. Um, I just felt like it was the right time for that group because they never lost in a finals. And while you can never predict the future, to me, it would have been hard for them to keep that going another year or two. As great as the Lakers were, for example, I mean, the Lakers lost a couple of finals, you know? <laughs> and then, yeah. um, and they won five ch- titles during Magic's era, but they also lost a couple, you know? Yeah. Um, so they lost three, as a matter of fact. So, you know, the Bulls, the thing that made the Bulls kind of different was that they never lost in the finals. And so... At, at some point, you maybe want to preserve that because it kind of makes you special. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, were there any special stories that you wanted to see in the document that you didn't, that maybe you told or you know? Mm-hmm. Well, no, I mean, not necessarily from my perspective. I think it's fair criticism of the documentary to say that, you know, Jerry Krause's point of view was not really championed by anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and whatever you think of Jerry personally. And I had a fine, my relationship was was fine. I didn't have any problems with him. Um, I know he wasn't great to the local media in Chicago. He lied to them. He told, you know, he was, he was brusque with them. And so they didn't particularly care for him. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is he built a championship team around Michael Jordan. You know, he didn't draft Jordan. Rod Thorne drafted Jordan, but, but he put everybody else in place, including Phil Jackson. You know, yeah. he's the guy that brought Phil Jackson into yeah, the organization. Yeah. So I thought someone who was in Jerry's front office, you know, should have been interviewed to speak on his behalf mm-hmm. and to at least say, here's why he said the things he said and here's why he did the things he did. Um, and he still could dismiss it if you wanted, but at least his, at least his point of view is on the record in the documentary. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, other than that, I mean, I think, you know, I, I know what Ken Burns has said about it, and there's some valid, validity to his argument. I mean, it's not, you know, David McCullough or Doris Kearns Goodwin's version of history. You know, they're mm-hmm. actual historians, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's Michael Jordan's version of Michael Jordan. And I get that, right? You know, I understand that, yeah. that that can be, you can dismiss that and say that it's not a full and accurate representation. But I'd rather get half a loaf than none. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like to me, if I, if the choice is, you know, Michael never talking about his career, or what you got in this documentary, which I think much, which was pretty darn compelling. Yeah. Um, I would rather have this than nothing. I guess is what I would say. So, and and I think grown people can make their own decisions about how much of it they're going to accept and how much of it they're going to be skeptical about because it's all it's all Michael's version about what happened Mm -hmm. um but I I, you know I still think it was really a really well done documentary yeah uh and of course what wasn't covered in the documentary was Jordan's return to basketball for a third time in DC (laughs) can you share any (laughs) memories (laughs) of covering him in D.C. Do you remember yeah. when he said, sure. I'm coming back again in the ownership and then again yeah. as a player? What What do you remember from that time that you can yeah. share? Well, I mean, it was a, you know, it was a, a, an odd, it was an odd group. And, and that's part of why it didn't work in the, in the end here. Um, because you still had the old guard and all of the people that A. Poland had hired over three decades. And one of the, you know, it was one of the things I loved about Abe and one of the things that drove me crazy about Abe was that he was so loyal. Mm-hmm. You know, literally, Jamoke, there were people there that were there when I started covering the team in 1988. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And you go, well, but they haven't been successful. Why wouldn't you fire them? You know, mm-hmm. um, and they were still there in 2001, 23 years later. And you just were, I was just amazed by that, you know, because most, most sports organizations, you get X number of years to be successful. And if you're not, then they get rid of you and they bring other people in. And Abe just did not do that. He Mm -hmm. was, he kept the same people around. So you had that group who was very loyal to Abe for obvious reasons, right? And then you had Jordan's group who was very loyal to Jordan for obvious reasons, right? So, and so you had this real clash of cultures, you know, the Jordan people kind of saying, yeah, you guys have sucked. (laughs) You should shut up and let us run the show. 
and the people that were loyal to Abe saying, hey, wait a minute, we're still here, we're still, you know, we still have authority and you, got, you have to respect our position. And so you, in that, in the midst of that, you had Jordan deciding to play again, right? And kind of set, up, upsetting everything that they were trying to do in terms of bringing in young players and rebuilding through young talent, you know, rebuilding through Kwame Brown and, and those guys that they, had, that they had drafted and Rip Hamilton and, and that group. Um, and so as, as it had to be, it became about Jordan again, yeah. um, which was to the detriment of those young guys. Now, you can be critical, and some have, and say Jordan was too hard on Kwame and, and drove him out of you know, didn't drive him out of the league. Kwame wanted to play in ten years, um, but drove him out of Washington certainly. Yeah, and that's there's probably some truth to that. But as you saw in the documentary, that's what he did. The problem there were two problems. He didn't have Pippen here. He yeah. didn't have a Pippen. Here. <laughs> yeah, he didn't have anybody that could kind of you know shoulder the burden, and he got hurt for the first time in his career, he got really injured and missed games, missed mm -hmm. 20 games and 25 games um, over those two years. Um, and so he wasn't able to do the things on the floor that he used to be able to do. Plus he was older and mm -hmm. wasn't able to do it. Now, having said all of that, he was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there's this narrative that he was just awful in DC. He wasn't awful to hope. He was a very good player. Yeah. He averaged 25 and four at 40 years old. He scored 50 points in a game, and then the next night scored 48 and was mad he didn't score 50. 50. <laughs> didn't have the back-to-back -back 50s. Yeah. You know, that team won 37. It went from 19 wins to 37 wins in two years. You tell me if that's not progress. I mean, yeah. um, so they didn't stink. They weren't as good as the Chicago teams, but he made them into a playoff contending team mm -hmm. at 40 years old with no help, essentially. You know, yeah. so um, or very little help, I should say. There was yeah. no help. There's very little help. So I view those Washington years to me, I look at it more as it's amazing to me <laughs> that he was able to be as effective as he was at that advanced age with far less help, with, with the level of help he had when he first came into the league with the Bulls in 84. You know, it was that level of talent mm -hmm. in, in Washington. Um, and, you know, so to me, it was – uh, there was a lot to admire. And the reason why, Jim, the main reason is why he knew the team wasn't good enough to win a championship when he mm -hmm. came back and played. And so all you're doing is putting yourself against your own legacy, which is going to be found wanting because your legacy is you won seven, six championships. Yeah. You, were the, you were one of the greatest players, if not the greatest player of all time, on one of the best teams of all time. Mm -hmm. And now you're now you're on this team, which isn't nearly as good, which has, doesn't have nearly as much talent, has no chance of being very much of a playoff team, even if they make the playoffs, and you're playing anyway, yeah. you know? And so to me, that, is, that speaks to what he always talked about, love of the game, that, you know, I think is something to be admired, even yeah. as we acknowledge he wasn't as good as he was in Chicago. Yeah. Um uh, to go back, I had a question for you, but I want to get to that Jordan in the, in the Wizards. Because sure. of Kobe's passing, there's been talk of, well, more because of the last dance. Oh, there should be a Shaq and Kobe documentary. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see one because Kobe's not here. Right. If you don't have Kobe in the present moment mm -hmm. talking about those years, right. you just can't right. do it. Have you ever thought of what other documentary you'd like to see? And could you see that one being made? Um, I mean, it's a very good point about, about you know, a potential – documentary on those those teams and in, in, in with the Lakers certainly um, um you know no nothing comes to mind I mean I think you know I would love to try and do something on the Spurs but I think it wouldn't be very good <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know how forthcoming they would be mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of how they are as an organization and to, you know again it doesn't if they're not going to be honest, I mean, what's the point? You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. um, and, and there's stories that you've heard over the years. I've certainly heard them, and I'm sure others have about what stuff that's going on in, in San Antonio's organization over the years. But you need those people to either to sit down and confirm those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be a great documentary to do about that group of people and the sustained excellence that they had over a you know almost 20 year period of competing and winning championships, but 
you know, if they're not going to be honest, if they're not going to talk, you know, on, if they're not all going to be honest about it, I don't know that, I, you know, it's worth people's time to look at. Um, yeah. Would I want to see the Shaq Kobe thing anyway without Kobe? I mean, it would, you'd have to come up with different ways of doing it. It would have to be, uh, it couldn't be this kind of he said, then he said, you know, kind of going back and forth. You, um, the, you do have a lot of video of Kobe, you know, talking about those years. So um, you could have his voice in it, but it would be different and it would be difficult to do. Okay. Obviously, it would be difficult yeah. to do. How much do you enjoy being back home, to come back home, to be the editor-in-chief for the Athletic, the D.C. region? Mm -hmm. You've been on the road for so many years. I mean, when did you – I felt like you were almost had, like, even harder than a playing career with ESPN, <laughs> Turner Sports, just always on the go. Yeah. What was the reasoning where you said, look, I, I really want to come back home? Well, it was twofold, Jamoke. I mean, first and foremost, the, the travel was getting hard. It was just getting hard to be out on the road as much as I was on the road. Just physically, as you get older, you just, I'll speak for myself, I just wasn't bouncing back as, as quickly as I, as I thought I needed to. Um, and I was tired a lot. And I did, you know, it was, you know, you, you try to be disciplined, you try to go to the gym as much as you can when you're on the road, and you try to eat right, but it's hard, because I know for my, you know, it's hard, I have trouble sleeping. Um, and so um, sleep was a problem for me on the road. And so you'd sleep three hours and wake up or you'd sleep four hours and wake up and that catches up with you after a while. So it was, you know, it was that it was the physical grind year after year after year. And, you know, it never really stopped because as soon as the finals were over, you had to go right into the draft, which was a week away. And as soon as the draft was over, you had to go right into free agency, which was two <laughs> days after that. And so, and then you had to go to the Vegas summer league and it just never stopped. Right. And so you were working 11 months out of the year, most of which you were on the road grinding and it just got hard for me. It right. got hard for me. But the other reason, which is more important is that, you know, we have two, my wife and I have two sons and, now they're both teenagers at the time they were they were younger a little younger one was a teenager one wasn't and you know you just look at the calendar and you go wow they're going to be gone in a couple of, in a few years sooner than you think yeah. right they're getting up there now to the point where they're going to you know the older boy's going to be going off to college soon and i didn't want to never have it spend any time with them yeah. you know cuz i was living out of a suitcase all those years and you know i was here but, you know, it's hard not to think about the next road trip, the next thing that you have to do. And um, I wanted to be more present, um, you know, just seeing them, just taking my son to school, you know, well, before the, before the yeah. pandemic, just yeah. driving him to school every morning. And he's a teenager. He doesn't say anything, but that's not the point. You're just spending yeah. time with your son, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I wanted to do that. I wanted to be more present in their lives and more accessible and available to them. And so those two things, and, and the opportunity, you know, if it hadn't been this opportunity, I probably wouldn't have done it. But, you know, I, I really liked what the athletic was doing. I thought it was a very smart idea. And I thought they had hired a lot of good writers. So there was a chance that this could work because the product is so good, you know. Um, and so you add all those things up. And I just kept saying, there's no reason for you not to do this, you know, like it, it, the answer is yes. You, you can't, you can't turn this down. You're going to be very upset with yourself if you turn this down. Yeah. And, and do you enjoy also maybe being a mentor to some of the younger writers, Fred Katz, sure. like, you know, just yeah. kind of helping them. And how, and are you almost having to mentor even more because they don't know what it's like to not be able to go to an arena or practice and get your yeah. sound bite that way. So I'm right. sure they're adjusting even more so than you might be. It, it has, that is, that is exactly true. Um, and yes, I mean, that was another big thing for me was that I really wanted to help young writers the way I was helped when I was a young writer when people would, you know, not only praise me, but challenge me and say, you know, you can do better. You need to, you need to make another call. You need to flesh this out. You need to do more work on this because it's not, it's not good enough yet, you know? And so um, I wanted to do that and help them out. And I hope I am helping them out um, because that's, was a, was definitely part of the equation as well. And we have some young writers that are really talented and I just want to be, you know, a sounding board for them, but 
you know, I have to be their boss. So I have to do those boss things that you have to do sometimes. Um, yeah. But you try to do it the way I do it. I can't do it the way my boss did it when I was young. I have to do it my, to be true to myself. So um, that was definitely part of it. And the opportunity to cover other stuff. You know, I mean, I love covering basketball. I love covering the NBA. But like I said, I got to go do the World Series last year. I wouldn't yeah. have gotten a chance to do that if I was still a Turner. I got to cover the WNBA finals last year. I wouldn't have gotten the chance to do that if I was still a Turner. So the chance to do other sports in the area um, that resonate with people, I think was, was also part of it as well. You ever find yourself driving around DC, just having memories of when you were younger, going to DeMatha or anything like that? Oh yeah, sure. From time to time, you know, you remember, um, you know, if, if it depends on where you are, you know, in the city, but certainly, yeah, yeah there's a memory of, oh yeah, you, we used to, we used to eat there. Or we used to get lunch there, or mm -hmm. that used to be the night spot afterwards, or that's where I used to go shopping. You know, there's a lot of yeah. box stores downtown that aren't there anymore. Yeah. You know, and you remember, <laughs> yeah. you remember those things and those places and those times. Sure. I mean, I've lived here, I've lived in DC all my life. I've never lived anywhere else um, I lived in Bethesda for a couple of years, but that's, you know, it's like yeah. DC adjacent, right? So, yeah. um, so I haven't, I've never moved. I never could think of a good reason to leave. So, I mean, I love this city and um, I love being around it. And certainly be, again, being in the city more is, is incredibly gratifying. Did you, did you get to watch basketball County in the water yet? I have not. It's TiVo. Okay. It's on the list. I okay. want to do okay. it. It looks like it's going to be great. I'm going to, I'm excited about it. I think it's a great, great story. Uh, the history of, of basketball in the DMV is, is, has been told a lot, but not specifically PG County. So I, I understand that that's, um, you know, it, and it's a rich history and it should be told in more detail. And I'm glad that that Kevin and, and Victor and all those guys and, and Quinn Cook are, are telling that story. Do you, uh, if there were, if it's DC or in Virginia versus Maryland in terms mm -hmm. of the type of talent that have come out of those three of the DMV, right. which team wins? I mean, I look, I think, I, you know, there's been, it, it depends, it depends on what, you know, where you stop counting Virginia, right? Because I think. Stop at AI. Like there well, I mean, geographically. So, yeah, right. if you're talking about Chesapeake and Norfolk, now you're including Moses Malone and you're including Alonzo Mourning and you're including Allen Iverson. That's a completely different discussion than Northern Virginia, which is mm -hmm. Grant Hill and, and Dennis Scott. Really great players, but not as many, right? So um, the DMV, if you're talking about the, the, the D.C. metropolitan area, you know, I, I mean, again, certainly PG County's had a, a great – cross-section of players over especially over the last 20 years um but you know with dc you're going back to dave bing you know you're mm -hmm. going back to elgin baylor you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying you know what i mean like so all-time best players adrian ever played. dantley adrian dantley exactly so you know uh kermit washington who doesn't mm -hmm. get the the attention he should get um so dc guy so um there's been a lot of great players come out of dc so i would probably say dc although durant would score 50 <laughs> nobody can guard it. We don't, there's nobody that can guard that guy coming out of DC. <laughs> so. How many David Aldrich moments do you get? And for those who don't know, it's called a David Aldrich moment. It should be in the <laughs> Merriam-Webster dictionary that when you have a moment of seeing somebody that's a superstar, a celebrity, and you see him in person, and you're like, that's my David Aldrich moment. Do you have any David Aldrich moments and or how many people come to you and talk about the David Aldrich moments which started on Tony Kornheiser's podcast? Um, you know, a lot, I guess. <laughs> Um, sure. I mean, I, there's people that I've met that, you know, there, or that I see that I admired and have admired, you know, from afar for a long time and, you know, get a chance to not always necessarily interview them, but just interact with them for a few minutes, you know, I mean, so, so certainly I've had my share of those over the years. I've been fortunate and lucky enough to, to have my share of those moments, um, over, over the course of my career. Certainly interviewing President Clinton and President Obama were, were two of those moments where you just, you're like, I can't believe I'm here doing this. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, it's, it, these, are, these are, you know, very important people, right? And so yeah. <laughs> them to, 
to give you a few minutes is, is something that's uh, certainly uh, very, uh, it's very gratifying and humbling and all of those things. Um, uh, you know, various people over the years, you know, in entertainment and actors and things like that, that I've, you know, met or had the pleasure of meeting like Robert De Niro and Tom Hanks at one of the, wow. at one of Obama's, when he gave the last presidential medal of freedom and he basically emptied the drawer and everybody got one. Yeah, yeah. Jordan got one and Ellen DeGeneres, so he just gave everybody one, right? And so to meet those people and be able to talk to them for a few minutes was, was spectacular, you know? Awesome. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I've been very blessed over the years to, to be able to meet some of my heroes. Last question. Uh, what is, what is David Aldrich like when he's not covering sports? Is there a hobby, something that you're able to kind of get back into during this pandemic, but also more because you're just home more? Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not much of a, I'm not much of a hobby person. I don't think. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I do crossword puzzles. I mean, I like okay. doing crossword puzzles. Um, but really, that's you know, I don't, you know, I I don't have something that. I'm kind of a workaholic, Jamo, because the answer okay. is the basic, <laughs> the basic book. I kind of am always working, uh, even when I'm at home. Um, so I spend a lot of time working, but just time with the family is the most important thing, you know, to be able to have dinner every night, the, you know, the four of us have dinner every night is, is pretty cool. And to be able to, to have done that for a few weeks now, even though, you know, we occasionally get on each other's nerves, but, you know, it's, you know, we're all so far, God bless, you know, thank you, God, healthy, and, and we're, we're okay. So, um, you know, there's a lot more to be thankful for than to be upset about. Thanks, David. I really appreciate you giving me some time. Uh, it's been My a pleasure. pleasure, and I wish you the best. And I'm listening to Hoops and Jason. I'm reading you on The Athletic. You're my favorite author that, that I'm uh, reading on there. And, and, and I love what you're doing, and glad you're back home. I appreciate it very much, Jamal. Thank you. All right. I want to thank David Alger for being my guest on Just for Sport. Really had a great time talking to him and learned something as well. I hope you did too. Thank you very much for listening. Please share and leave a review. You can catch future pods on YouTube. Uh, you can catch my last week's pod with Karan Butler right here on the Props Network YouTube page. But you can also catch my pods if you just want to listen on Google Pods, Apple, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more platforms. Thanks for your support. Thanks for listening. Ciao for now.